Welcome to Montreal First Christian Reformed Church. My name is Chaplain Michelle Depuder. I am a chaplain with the Ministry to Seafarers in Montreal, and I will be leading the service this morning. Let us begin with prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our God calls us to worship. Let us worship God, our light and our salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. We desire to live in God's house and to seek God in his holy temple. We have come with shouts of joy to sing and to make music to the Lord. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Teach us your ways and make straight our paths in this time of worship and always. And God greets us with these words. To those who are called, who are beloved in God the Father and kept safe for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 5. But before we read, let us come to God in prayer. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 5 Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go! Wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. 
Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elisha said. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money, or to accept clothes, or olive groves and vineyards, or flocks and herds, or male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence, and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story of Naaman is one of those famous Bible stories. It's one that children learn about in Sunday school. We've probably heard sermons about Naaman and how God can heal, or we've heard sermons or teaching on the faith of of a servant girl and the powerful general being humbled. So for many of us, this is a familiar story with an interesting cast of characters. We start out here by being introduced to Naaman. He is a commander of the army of the king of Aram or Assyria, a great man, highly regarded, a valiant soldier. He was used to being respected and having everyone do what he wanted. He just had one little problem. He had leprosy. Now in Israel, lepers had to live outside the city and they weren't allowed to be part of society. Having leprosy was a curse. It doesn't seem quite that bad for Naaman since he was a commander of the army, but it was definitely something that concerned him or at least it concerned his wife enough that the servant girl knew to say something. Now at this time, it was likely that Israel and Aram were on a bit better terms with each other. There was an active war at least. But the Arameans were still raiding the border towns of Israel. And on one of these raids, they took a young girl who became a servant in the household of Naaman. We don't really know anything about her. She is never named. And the only mention of her is when she tells Naaman's wife that Naaman should go and see the prophet in Israel 
who would be able to heal Naaman? Even though this girl was young, she was old enough to have heard about Elisha and the miracles that God had done through him. It also seems that she was well regarded in the household because Naaman's wife didn't just dismiss her comment and ignore it, but spoke to Naaman, who then spoke to the king about it. At this point, Naaman is somewhat agitated. He has an incurable disease, but now he has been given hope that he can be cured. When he goes to the king, the king is supportive and tells Naaman to head to Israel to find out how to be cured. And the king even sends a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. This really shows how much the king valued Naaman. You don't usually send a letter of introduction to another person in a place of authority if you don't value them. It would be like one of us going to the president of our company with a personal problem and that telling the, the president that we have heard that someone from our biggest competitor can solve our problem. So our company president tells us that we can take the time off to travel to another country as paid time off, and we don't even have to use our vacation time for it. But even more, he will write a personal letter of introduction to the president of the competitor asking for help. This is a pretty good deal for Naaman, and it probably lowered his agitation level quite a bit. He could see that something was happening. So off Naaman goes to Israel. He heads to the palace and gives the king of Israel the letter. And the king, instead of knowing what to do or who to call, tears his clothes and has a full-on pity party. He immediately assumed that the king of Aram sent Naaman to him as a trick. Heal my commander or else. The king of Israel knew he didn't have the power to heal Naaman, and he really didn't have any type of relationship with God that allowed him to see that God was the one who could heal. The king of Aram probably assumed that if a servant girl knew there was someone in Israel who could heal, then of course the king would know the same person and most likely would have this person as part of his court. Kings usually kept advisors, wise men, healers, and prophets close to them at the palace, and the king of Aram likely had similar people of his own as part of his court. The king of Aram had no way of knowing that Elisha was not welcome at the palace. He wouldn't have known that the king was as far away from the God of Israel as you could get. And so the king of Israel is agitated, and instead of doing something constructive, he tears his robes, and succumbs to the poor me syndrome, assuming that the king of Aram is out to get him. Elisha hears all about this and sends a message to the king to send Naaman to him. Now Naaman was full of his own self-importance. He had a letter from his king. He had gold, silver, and clothing worth an awful lot of money. One commentary I read estimated the amount as over $1 million in, in today's money. So he was an important man. And he assumed that Elisha would treat him with the deference to which he was accustomed. But Elisha doesn't do that. Elisha doesn't even appear. He just sends a message out of the house telling Naaman to wash seven times in the Jordan River. How frustrated Naaman must have been. He had gone through all the trouble of coming to Israel, showing up at the palace, then coming over to the prophet's house. He had expended a lot of time and effort to meet Elisha, and then the prophet doesn't even come to the door? And the request to wash in the Jordan River seven times. What sort of treatment was that? It was just insulting. And so a frustrated Naaman stomps off. He thought he deserved so much more. His servants had it right, though. They remind him that if Elisha had asked him to do something dangerous, something that would take great effort or sacrifice, something where he had to prove his ability or strength, Naaman would have done it without a second thought. But this request seemed so inconsequential. Really, 
how does dipping in a river show what kind of person you are? How does that prove that you are worthy of healing? But Naaman listens to his servants, heads to the Jordan River, washes seven times, and when he comes up after the seventh time, he realizes that he has been healed. His body is as clean and blemish-free as a young boy. Naaman realizes immediately what has happened. He knows that he has been a recipient of a miracle and that he couldn't have done it on his own. He likely tried all kinds of treatments, prayers, and offerings back at home, and nothing worked. He even said he would have rather washed in one of the rivers at home because they were cleaner. So it was clear to him that his healing was completely due to a miracle. He rushes back to Elisha's house, and this time Elisha comes out to meet him. Can you imagine the look of joy and excitement on Naaman's face as he tells Elisha that he now knows there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He has had an encounter with the true God, and it has changed his life. He offers to give Elisha a gift, but Elisha refuses. Naaman then asks if it is possible to take as much earth as two mules can carry so that he can worship on earth from Israel. This is quite interesting. Perhaps if Elisha had taken the gifts, Naaman would have gone on his way feeling like he had given his offerings to God. But instead, he now asks to take dirt home with him. At that time, people understood gods to be confined to a certain place. So in Naaman's mind, he had to have a piece of Israel with him in order to properly worship God. We don't know what happened when Naaman went back to his home, whether he continued to worship God or not, but in this moment, he trusted and believed. But this isn't the end of the story. We have one character who is actually an important part of the story. Elisha's servant Gehazi was observing everything. Gehazi is mentioned a couple of times within the stories of Elisha, and we can assume that he had been with Elisha for a while. He had seen miracles. He knew who God was and what God could do. We can probably assume that he trusted God. But in this interaction between Elisha and Naaman, Gehazi gets frustrated. He lets his wants and desires take precedence over doing what God wanted. After Naaman leaves, Gehazi waits a bit, and I can imagine he becomes more and more frustrated. He keeps thinking about the chests filled with gold and silver that he saw being carried back to Aram, and he looks down at his clothes. They're looking a little worn, and he saw what the servants of Naaman were wearing. Their clothes were just a bit nicer than his. And then maybe he thinks, why should all those riches just go back to Aram? They are still technically the enemy. And as Naaman leaves, Gehazi makes a decision. He waits for a bit and then runs after Naaman. Gehazi doesn't just ask for things for himself. Instead, he makes up a story. He tells Naaman that Elisha sent him because they had sudden visitors. Not only does Gehazi's greed get the better of him, but he also lies to Naaman about wanting the money and clothes. Gehazi forgot everything he had seen over his time with Elisha. Instead of continuing to trust God and follow God's commands, Gehazi let his frustration, his greed, and his desires get the best of him. He knew what he was doing was wrong. Otherwise, he would have brought the money and clothing back to Elisha but instead he hid them in the house. You don't hide something unless you know you're doing wrong. And when Elisha asks Gehazi where he has been, Gehazi continues to lie. His own desires have completely overwhelmed his knowledge and trust of God. Elisha asks Gehazi a very important question. 
Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money, or to accept clothes, or olive groves and vineyards, or flocks and herds, or male and female slaves? It was during this time that almost everyone in the country of Israel had turned away from God. The reign of the kings of Israel was almost finished, and the country would soon be conquered by Assyria. The people had rejected God and gone their own way. They worshipped other gods, and like Gehazi, they let their own desires come first before worship of the one true God. Gehazi knew these things. He had just seen a great miracle in the life of a foreigner. If God was willing to heal a foreigner who then confessed his trust and devotion, wouldn't God be even more a part of the lives of the people he had promised to be with? The people who he had sent prophet after prophet to call the people back to himself? The people of Israel had no excuse to not know God. But because Gehazi conveniently forgot everything he knew about God, and instead of trusting in God, he decided to trust in himself and fulfill his own desires for riches and property, he would now be cursed with leprosy. Too often we live our lives the same way as Gehazi. We have experienced the love of God. We express our trust in him. We have seen God at work in our lives and in the lives of others. And then at one point we forget everything. We forget the sacrifice of Jesus. We take for granted who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And we let frustration and agitation creep into our lives. We become dissatisfied with what we have and no longer trust in God for our daily bread. We let our desire for worldly goods become more important than following God's commands. I think we have all heard stories on the news of people convicted of various crimes who say that it just started with one small thing, one small overlooking of a mistake, one small taste of riches or power, and that was how it all started. And then things kept going and they amassed riches or power until finally everything collapsed, not only taking them down, but in many cases, innocent people who trusted them. Gehazi be betrayed the trust of Elisha he was no longer an example to the people around him of his trust in God and that God would provide for him. But we also know that even if we have fallen away, even if we have let our desires and wants get the better of us, God won't give up on us. God was willing and able to heal Naaman, a man who is probably as far away from God as you could get. He was not a part of Israel. He was an enemy of Israel who had fought against them. He had leprosy, a disease that prevented someone from entering the temple. And yet, God still healed him and showed his power and love. God is not God only for a specific group of people. He showed his love for everyone when he sent his son Jesus into the world to die for us. The Apostle Paul wrote about the power of God in his letter to the Ephesians and says in Ephesians 1, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. God desires to be in communion with all his children, and he calls us to him. He wants us to leave all our agitation and frustration on him and to trust in him. And in response to the work of God in our lives, we can confess, as Naaman did, that we know 
that there is no other God in the world. Amen. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us with your word. Grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints, we offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. O Lord of Providence, holding the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. O God, the Creator, we pray for all nations and peoples Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your children. O Savior God, look upon your church in its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on its weakness. Bring to an end its unhappy divisions and scatter its fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase its courage strengthen its faith and inspire its witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our offerings this morning are for our local church ministry here in Montreal and for Resonate Global Mission. As the time of our worship comes to a close, hear now God's invitation to a life of Christian discipleship. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Help the suffering. Honor all, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. <laughs>